The Tolkien Road, Episode 70, Concerning Gandalf and the Astari. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we take a close look at the background of Gandalf and his wizard brethren, the Astari. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. John here. Greta, put the Brothers Karamazov array away. Array? Array, away. Away. You know what I meant. Okay. Jeez, we're talking, this is the Tolkien podcast. All right. Man. That's really What good. if Tolkien was sitting here and we were about to start a podcast for his work mm-hmm. and you were reading something by Dostoevsky? I don't think he'd have a problem with it. I think he would. I don't think he would. Well, why? Because he was a communist? No, Tolkien wasn't a communist. No, I mean Dostoevsky. I don't think Dostoevsky was either. He was Russian. Well, that doesn't mean he's a communist. Well, why would Tolkien have he a communist? He was from the 19th century. Then? It wasn't even... Oh, you're right. That's I think right. that's right. Back, it is. You're right. It is. It's the 18th century. I don't really know my yeah. Russian lit very well, but... I don't either, actually. I, yeah. but, so why do you think Tolkien would have a problem with it? Because it's his podcast. Okay, well... Because I've I said it, he would. I've put it away. All right. And now we're focused on Tolkien. We are fo- not only focused on Tolkien, but we're focused on Gandalf. Gandalf. Yes, Gandalf and Gandalf, Gandalf the, the Grey. Gray. Gandalf the Wizard, and um, his brethren, the Astari. His yes. wizarding brethren, the Astari. Astari. So that's what this episode is all about. Whenever I hear the word Astari, I think of that video game, or Atari. Atari. You mean Atari. the video game console? Is that what it was? Yeah. I, I never had one. Yeah. I just heard of it. But it may, reminds me of that. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yep. Interesting, Greta. They sound Thanks alike. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Any other random facts? So I just want to make sure this? our listeners didn't get, you know, that they were clear they were talking about a starry, not a tarry. Yeah. Because they kind of sound a lot alike. I, uh, I think they're clear. Okay. Just wanted to be sure. But, um, well, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure your comment probably just made things more confusing for most people, but uh, but, no, I won't, I don't, but I won't hold it against I you. I don't think it did, actually. Well, maybe, I think, I think we'll there were a lot of people out there that appreciated the fact that I was willing to clarify. Maybe we'll just uh, poll our listeners, you know, about yeah. what they think. I don't know that we necessarily need to do that. Well, I know what we do need to do. What do we need to do? We need to do... A little haiku time, a brief haiku time. Wait, you told me there was no haiku times. I know. This one. Respect the song. Respect the game. <laughs> Oops. Who's not respecting now, Johnny? I'll just dance. You. I'll just dance. Mm hmm. Oh, Greta's doing some kind of strange robot dance. Man, okay. Oh. I never realized how uh, I never realized how well that song lent itself to the robot That's, dance. Yeah, it's pretty perfect, mm-hmm. actually. Yes, it is a thing of perfection. I can actually wonder. visualize in my head a bunch of robots dancing to that song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Yep. Um. All right. So here's the deal. We we didn't really have any haiku per se, but I feel really bad because in the last two Lord of the Rings episodes, we did, Mary, you know, one of our frequent haiku contributors, Mary Grace, one of our super fans, she contributed a few, some haiku for both episodes, and I couldn't find them for either one. I, I couldn't remember if she had done them, and I couldn't find them for either one, and then I found them after the fact, and um, uh, so Mary Grace 
we're going to do those on the next Lord of the Rings episode, the ones that she already submitted. But she also went ahead and, because just because she's a super fan, and did one for Gandalf. So um, I was going to read that one, and, and she'll be the only one we do in this episode, and hopefully this kind of makes up the uh, makes up for the mistake. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. Heals heals all wounds. I don't think there was any wounds to be healed on her part. Yeah, well. I think it's you just beating yourself up over it. And yeah, that's well, what she yeah, I mean, she was totally cool about she it. She was but, totally cool. You know, I still, you know, I still feel kind of bad. I mean, I you know. know. But at some point, you need to get Mary over Grace it. Mary Grace has, uh, has been there for the Tolkien Road. She has. When few Absolutely. others have been. Absolutely, and I think this is know? a nice way to honor her. That's right. Absolutely. That's right, so here we go. Mary Grace haiku concerning Gandalf. Bearer of Narya, a friend to the free peoples, he, Gandalf the Grey. Nice. Right, one more time. One more time. Okay. Bearer of Narya, a friend to the free peoples, he, Gandalf the Grey. Nice. He. Yeah. Nice is the right way to describe that. The like, one. Nice. Pretty sweet. Mm hmm. Well done, as usual, Mary Grace. Yep. Good job, Mary Grace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, so let me say this too. Um, we're going to be recording the next two episodes of Lord of the Rings together. So if you want to get haiku onto those um, for chapters 2 8 and 2 9, mm -hmm. then you need to have them submitted by uh, August 3rd. August 3rd. August so, 3rd. Yeah. What do you mean by 2 8? But you mean for 28? Like, no. Book 2, Chapter 8, and Book oh, 2, Chapter 9. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, meaning. Fellowship, book two, chapter eight. I forgot eight. that it was more than book one book two, in Fellowship. Nine. My bad. Yeah. There's six total books of Lord of the Rings. Two in each. You, you need to go back and listen to the for introductory episode we did for Lord of the Rings, obviously. Uh, maybe I do. Yeah. Probably. I've been on vacation too long. Sorry. Yeah, you're, all, you're always on. You're, you're off in Russia somewhere right now. Mm, off wish. in a gulag. I wish. Um, I don't wish you were in the gulag. You really don't. This is going to reach a point in this episode where I'm just going to hide under the table and read my book. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe I'll imagine myself doing that. All right. Transition point. Let's bring it back to Tolkien. Tolkien. Spoiler alert. Okay. Uh -oh. So, wait. For I know for those of you who have not actually finished The Lord of the Rings, oh. or even who haven't listened to the Silmarillion, or, or you know, listened to our Silmarillion episodes, or, or read the Silmarillion, um. We're going to be giving away some things about Gandalf, and especially like what happens later. yeah, like what happens later yeah. with Gandalf yeah. and Lord of the Rings. So, um, so spoiler alert: I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna briefly have a moment of silence to allow you to make the decision in your in your inner person of whether okay. you want to uh, leave this behind. Don't pick up your book. Put that down. Just a moment of put silence. Put 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 Dostoevsky <laughs> down. Um, we're gonna have a moment, okay. and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna reveal spoilers. So you have five, four, three, two, one. Okay, here comes the spoiler. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Am I? Gandalf is Darth Vader's father. What? Yeah. What? And there's a whole bunch of other spoilers you'll find out about, but. Anyway, oh my gosh. Um, so I hope you've been warned. So the spoilers are coming. Um, all right, what? You're so weird. What? How am I weird? I'm trying to give people the opportunity to turn away before it's too late. So you're giving a fake spoiler? No, I, I was being—I was just being silly about that. Oh. But there's there are going to be spoilers, right? Right, there are going to be rings. spoilers, like real spoilers. Yeah, yeah, there are going to be real ones. Yeah. Yeah. So I, okay. All right. Thank you, Captain Obvious. So it's Darth. All right. Darth Vader, Star yeah. Wars. Mm -hmm. Not Tolkien. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You got my head on straight now. All right. So, so we're gonna start off by, um, by looking at Valaquenta. All right. Good old Valaquenta. Uh, we covered Valaquenta like in episode three or four oh, or something yep. like that, right? Yep. We sure did. Um, and. Uh, yeah, in Valaquenta, there's this little bit under of the Maiar, um, page 30 of my edition, at the very bottom, it says, 
Wisest of the Maiar was Olorin. He too dwelt in Lorien, but his ways took him often to the house of Niena, and of her he learned pity and patience. Of Melian much is told in the Quintus Silmarillion, but of Olorin that tale does not that tale does not speak. For though he loved the elves, he walked among them unseen, or in form as one of them, and they did not know whence came the fair visions or the promptings of wisdom that he put into their hearts. In later days he was the friend of all the children of Iluvatar, and took pity on their sorrows. And those who listened to him awoke from despair and put away the imaginations of darkness. All right, so as you may have figured out, if you didn't already know, Olorin here, this is this is the earliest you know mention in terms of timeline mm -hmm. of Gandalf. Gandalf yes. is Olorin. So what do we learn from this? We learn that Gandalf is a Maiar, mm -hmm. right? And as a Maiar, he is one of the Ainur, right? He's one of the he's one of the beings that Iluvatar created, right? right? And yes. So so that to me is just a cool little thought, right? Mm -hmm. Gandalf, even though he's a lesser Ainur because he's a Maiar. He's still a great being, and he was there at uh, the music of the Ainur, yeah. right? He was there yeah. for Ainur Lindale, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. For the, the music that created everything. That's just kind of a, a cool little thing to consider about him, um, you know, as you consider his his character and the, and the, the scope and history of his character. Um, but I really like that um, that he learns... He spent a lot, basically it says he spent a lot of time with Nienna. Now, do you remember yeah. who Nienna is? Isn't she like the, um, she's the one that cries yeah. all the time, right? Yeah, right. She's the one like when the two trees, she, and she's a Valar. Um, yeah. She's not one of the better known Valar, but right. yeah, one of the main, like one of the main events that she has um, is when the two trees, um, I'm sorry, when the lamps are, um, I should have... I should have re I should have re referenced this, and now I'm getting myself mixed up. I think it's when the lamps are thrown down in chapter one of the beginning of days. Okay. Um, Nienna and Yavanna kind of collaborate to grow, um, to grow the two trees. But I think it's also um, when the two trees are destroyed. Nienna also weeps over them. Yes. And um, I'm trying to look it up right now. Waters them with her tears. Right. right? Well, mm, well, not water. She washes that, like she... I think she washes away a lot of the filth of. Oh um, right, from Ungoliant um, and yes. Melkor. Yeah. Especially Ungoliant. Cleanses, yeah, cleanses with her tears. Right. Um, I'm looking it up. Oh, I should have. I should have researched this. So is that, <clears> I mean, does that? Do it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yeah. John's knocked himself out. I'm going <laughs> to read my book. Um. So what does that mean, though? That like that Gandalf, because in so in her haiku, Mary Grace called him the bearer mm -hmm. of Nienna, and then in there it says that he spent a lot of time with her. So like, what does that mean? That they were like good friends, or she, he was her sidekick, or more what? like I think I think just more like um, I mean we don't know the details, but all we know is that like basically he learned from Nienna. Right, he okay. learned much from Nienna. Okay. You know? Okay. Because um, it says he learned pity and patience from okay. her. Okay. Um, right. Which is... Um, which is important because one of the things that contrasts Gandalf with Saruman is his sympathy towards weaker things, right? Yes. Saruman yeah. is, like, very prideful and haughty and Gandalf finds wisdom in not being that way. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Which, sometimes when you're greater, you know, when you're greater than everybody else and you know you are, um, you need you need that humility. You need that reserve of humility and, and an understanding of the goodness and the patent of patience and humility and the wisdom of patience and humility not to let your own abilities make you full of yourself and consequently a fool, you know? Absolutely. So, well, darn, I can't find this little bit. Well, it's um, okay. No. Because we're talking about Gandalf, not Nienna. I know, but I wanted to get that right. I was like, I had it all like, oh, well, we'll talk about Nienna. And then I was like, and I thought I knew what I was going to say. And then I realized that um, I wasn't quite ready. So, um, yeah. 
But anyway, Nana plays an important part in you know the lights, right, in the creation of the different lights um, that are in uh, that are in Valinor, right? Yes. So we'll just kind of right. we'll kind of leave it at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So. Um, so anyway, Valaquenta. That's what we learn about Gandalf from Valaquenta. Um, next, uh, I wanted to look at one of Tolkien's letters. So this is letter. So if you don't have it, one of the best books to have um, of Tolkien's writings is his letters. Especially if you um, if you like to go into the background of things. He's got there's so much good stuff in his letters, and um, the first thing I'm going to read from his letters. To, for this episode is from a letter he wrote to Michael Strait of the New Republic. Um, Michael Strait was writing a review of the Lord of the Rings and it sent Tolkien a bunch of different questions. And so Tolkien, you know, Tolkien's like just about any artist, you ask, start asking him a lot of questions about his, about his work and, you know, he goes way far into it. Yes. And that's kind of how this letter is. Tells you more than you ever wanted to know. Right. And probably doesn't really clear anything up for you. Just makes it a little just, bit more confusing. Just but it a little bit more. But yeah. for people who really love Tolkien, this stuff is, you know, it's a treasure trove. Um, so, in this first little, in this little snippet that, um, and it, towards the end of this letter, it's letter 181 to Michael Strait, um, Tolkien says a few interesting things about Gandalf. Um, first of all, he says that Gandalf is a created person, though possibly a spirit that existed before in the physical world. Um, so, you know, keep in mind, this, this is written in the mid-50s, before, well before the, pub, the actual official publication of the Silmarillion. So Tolkien was still working some of this stuff out about who Gandalf was, his background, even here. Okay. Okay. But he had a lot of it figured out. And he said his function as a wizard is, an, is as an angelos or messenger from the Valar or ruler. So... You know, really, we could we could easily liken Gandalf to being an angel, right? Like that mm. he he's an angel in the sense that he is sent from a greater power as a as a, yeah, messenger, as a messenger, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think it's key to understand that the messenger is a big part of that. That he's he carries a message of sorts. You know, his the message is his mission in a way, right? And it's, um, uh, as we're going to see, he, he can't really spend all of his energy trying to kind of like be the great power that, you know, resists Sauron himself, right? Right. Gandalf's job is to bring out the greatness in others and lesser mm-hmm. beings in order that they can resist. And to unify them. And to unify them, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what Tolkien says about this is um, uh, he talks about, you know, kind of his philosophy of power, that when power, when great power dominates or seeks to dominate other wills and minds, um, except by the ascent of their reason, it's evil. Um, so the wizards are, like Gandalf and like Saruman, are capable of both good and evil. They are moral actors, Right. Yes. Um, yes. They have free will, mm-hmm. and they can choose to use their great power to dominate lesser beings, like Saruman. Well, oh, like you're talking about lesser beings. Well, no, like I'm talking about who who was the original one that dominated oh, others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. All, that's all I was getting at. Yeah. Um, you know, Melkor was all about domination, right? Domination mm-hmm. of lesser things. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the the wizards in order to do good, are explicitly forbidden from being like Melkor, right? From using right. their powers. You know, that's the temptation for them, is right. to use their great power. They can power. still choose to do that. Yes. They have something they have to fight against. Right. 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 Um, so, um, they were also, for the same reason, thus involved in the peril of the incarnate. So, the in- in- incarnate, incarnation, means that is the idea of a spirit being given a body. Right. Right. Um, so is that saying that Gandalf was an incarnate creature? Yeah. That he was a spirit right. in flesh. Yeah, just like all of the all, the, all of the Ainur that came to yeah. uh, Middle Right, yeah, they now, took on their bodies to help. Yeah. Now that's an interesting thing because I, my understanding is the Valar 
could kind of take physical form as they chose and, and also take it off. Like, I think that was in the early and in some early and it talks about that. They could oh. take physical form, but then they could take it off like it was clothing. Right, 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 right. Whereas yeah. Gandalf, I think, while he exists in Middle Earth, or in, um, you know, in the, uh, you know, when he comes to the eastern part of the world on his mission um, out of the west, he's he has to take on, he has to kind of keep the clothes on, if you will, the whole time. He can't, he can't um, disrobe out of his flesh and just show himself the great spirit that he is, right? Got it. So, and I think that applies to all the wizards. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so, in, in, because of that, he's also, I mean, in, in a way he's bound, you know, he's, he's bound to his body while he's there. So in a way it's kind of like a, um, uh, it's almost like a, a form of, you know, a strange form of like being in, in chained in a way, you know, because, because he has flesh, he's also subject to the things of the flesh, right? Like, right. He gets hungry, he gets hungry, and he gets sad tired. and tired. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. He can be hurt, right? Mm -hmm. Physically hurt, and it'll be, it'll yeah. hurt his spirit. Whereas a spirit, you know, can't be physically hurt, so right. it doesn't that doesn't take a toll on them like right. it does us, right? Right. He can like be slain, like, like he can be. Yeah, yeah. Killed. Um. So, and then he also has the possibility of fall, of sinning, um, of fail, you know, of failing to live the way he should. Right. 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 Um. So the more we talk about this, it sounds like so much of. I mean, it's, it draws so many, so many similarities to, you know, Jesus, who's mm -hmm. God incarnate, right, right, in the Bible. But I feel like, doesn't Tolkien come out and say in some part there that he doesn't want people to draw that comparison? Yeah, well, he says, um, in the same little passage here, he says, um, but though one may be be in this reminded of the Gospels, it is not really the same thing at all. The incarnation of God is an infinitely greater thing than anything I would dare to write. Mm -hmm. Here I am only concerned with death as part of the nature, physical and spiritual, of man, and with hope without guarantees. Um, I didn't understand that when I read it. I mean, I, like, I, mean, I don't understand that. I understand the first part about, obviously, God incarnate is a much greater thing than, you know, like Tolkien wouldn't want to be compared to that but what does he mean that he's cons what he's only concerned as far as Gandalf goes he's only concerned with death mm -hmm. right yeah death is part of the na the nature physical and spiritual of man and with hope without guarantees and with hope without guarantees yeah what does he mean by that um it's a good question I think um uh, I think he's trying to limit the scope of of the implications of, of incarnation, right? Like for what he's writing. Okay. Um, I mean, for Tolkien as a devout Catholic, like the incarnation is everything, right? right. The oh, incarnation yeah. is like, yeah. you know, there's, we have nothing without there's, the incarnation. there's two central mysteries of Christianity, right? The first is the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. And the second is the incarnation, right? right? Cause without the incarnation, you don't have the resurrection. You don't have the redemption, you don't have redemption, right? right? Like the redemption of man uh, and, and of the cosmos. So, right. The incarnation is like is everything, right? Right. The incarnation has limitless implications, and I think two things. Tolkien is trying to be humble here. He's trying to say mm -hmm. like I'm, you know, I, I'm not reaching to through my work to have some profound I'm reflection. Not trying to make Gandalf into a Christ character. Yeah, I don't think he wants to raise him quite to that mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. um, but he's also, you know, Tolkien always strove not to allow his works just to become allegory. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he wanted, you know, he wanted them to stand on their own. Now, I think all of this is still bound up, but it's with with his views of Christianity. But it's all in a much more um, sort of. It's not. It's not such a linear way, right? It's a more. It's a more all encompassing way. Okay. Um, I don't know. We can, you know. Yeah. It's a it's one we could dwell on for long periods. That's a question we could yeah. dwell on for long periods of time. Well, I um, thought it was beautiful the way like hope without guarantees. I'm like I love that idea. Mhm. Mm but I didn't understand it. Yeah. I know it's beautiful, but I'm like I can't really wrap my brain around it. Yeah, well, and he may even be like kind of um saying that you know, because in on fairy stories he talks about the incarnation as the 
is the catastrophe of man's history. God, you know, mm-hmm. the incarnation of Christ. Right. And and then the the resurrection is the catastrophe of the incarnation. Right. Right. Yes. Um. And um, here, and and one of the things that we believe as Christians is that um, the resurrection of Christ gives us definitive hope. Mm-hmm. Right. And the mm-hmm. triumph over death. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. That it's no longer in question. You know, now that's not to say that we don't struggle with it in faith. Right. But yeah, but sure, at the same yeah. time, as an article of faith is something we cling to. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, our hope in our eyes is a concrete, real thing. Like it's 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 a done deal. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That there is hope that, that ultimately there's hope. For mankind to triumph over death, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, now, and so it's interesting that what he says is, um, "I'm only con- here. I'm only concerned with death as part of the nature, physical and spiritual, of man, and with hope without guarantees." Right. So yeah. it's almost like he's saying because this all happens pre-resurrection, right? Mm. Um, there's none of you know none of these hope none of this hope is in, involved, right? Like not not the Christian hope is not involved here, it. right? Yeah. It's only this sort of vague hope this sense that like this can't be all there is Mm -hmm. right this can't be like death cannot death just seems like it can't be the end yeah right yeah um it's something we have to submit to but death just seems like it can't be all that there is to say about our story you know yeah um so it's a pre-christian hope i guess you could say that makes sense right that makes a lot of sense um okay good i'm glad that made sense because i was just kind of making it up as i went (laughs) oh well good job (laughs) (laughs) this this is actually something i think about a lot and i've tried to start writing about it more on the on true myths um as i get a chance you know it it really gets to the heart of one of the things that i find so fascinating about tolkien Mm. but anyway i digress um great question um so uh, the chief form of temptation that the wizards are subject to is impatience. So maybe mm-hmm. we just say it's, pow- you know, being tempted to use their power um, for the things they shouldn't, mm-hmm. and impatience towards the things in their mission, right? right? And trying to make their mission achieve their mission too quickly or with, I guess, too aggressively, maybe. You know. Yeah. Most two kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, they I do. Think. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be very easy to be impatient when you are this, you know, great, you know, this great spirit who's being forced to, mm-hmm. to, to travel a road with lowly, you know, hobbits and even elves, right? I mean, yeah. everyone that he's hanging out with in these books is a lesser being than he is. Right. And it's hard to be patient mm-hmm. when you know, you know he could just cast a spell, <laughs> right? And yeah, like, we're gonna do it my way. So yeah, it's kind of like, um, well, I mean, it's kind of like the, the the temptation of the ring for Frodo, right? Um, mm. And and others, right? Yeah. You know, Frodo has this ring, which is so powerful, and he can use it to hide from other beings, and right. you know, it's got to be this great constant temptation to be able to use it, but you have mm-hmm. to you have to resist, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, the last thing I want to pull out of this little passage is um, is the fact that Saruman succumbs. Saruman succumbs to this temptation, and Gandalf does not. And he says, But the situation became so much the worse by the fall of Saruman that the good were obliged to greater effort and sacrifice. Um, so Saruman, through his fall, and this is true always of fall, of the fall, right, of... of of evil deeds, right? Mm-hmm. Evil deeds mean that in order to achieve the good, more is required of those trying to achieve the good, right? Yes. An evil deed results in more problems, right? More problems for everyone, okay? And I, I think this is a great insight um, because what he says is the good were obliged to greater effort and sacrifice. So it's almost like you're down further in the hole because of the evil that someone else did. Maybe you're down further in the hole because of the good you did, but you want to climb out, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and to but to do so, greater greater effort and sacrifice is required, yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, but that also means, and I think this is this is something that as I've thought about the problem of evil over a long time, you know, um, that you know how why is it that God allows evil to exist, mm-hmm. right? Um, it was something that Tolkien struggled with, you know, throughout his life, yeah. but pondered throughout his life. 
and, and most philosophers do, right? Um, if, you know, why, why, is the, why is evil allowed to exist, right? If God is all-powerful, then why is evil allowed to exist? Um, and at least in part, it seems like Tolkien would answer that question by saying that um, out of the evil, a greater good comes, right? That, and part of that is the greater moral action of those who mm. do the good, right? That's required of those. It's, it's a greater heroism, basically. Is that the idea? Isn't that the idea of the eucatastrophe? Yeah, yeah. No, that's part of it. Definitely. It's part of it. Yeah. Right. That there's this greater, um, there's this greater beauty because the free will of the person who did the evil is what caused the problem in the first place. And that means a greater free will is required, you know, a greater use of free will is required to overcome it, right? Yes. So, yeah. anyway. Yeah. I think that's, uh, it's very logical. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just, um, someone, someone else wanted to bring out in that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. You with me? You follow me? Um, We're good? So far, so good. All right. Let's you haven't look at... lost me yet. Good. All right. Well, if I lose you, let me know. Okay. All right. I'm gonna sip, I'm gonna drink some water. Okay. All right. Is it okay? It's dripping, That's okay. Dripping on me. Oh, condensation. Hmm. I think that black cherry flavor is my favorite. It's good. Yeah. The black cherry and the orange. We've I like been, the mandarin we've been, orange. We've been drinking this. Um, we started drinking more like fizzy water. What do you call it? Sparkling water. Sparkling water. Yeah. I like drinking that stuff. I like zero drinking. calories, but it tastes. Taste, uh, you kind of got to get used to it at first, but like the black cherry. Yeah. It's nice. It's yeah. nice. I mean, it's, I know it's funny. I feel like, um, actually, I was talking about this with somebody the other day about how companies that are making like these flavored sparkling waters, like LaCroix and Deer Park and these other companies mm -hmm. that have started doing this, they're like, they're making a ton of money because so many people are trying to quit soda. So it's kind of like, it's like nicotine. Yeah. For soda drinkers. Because you still have the carbonation, and you still have the flavor of soda, right? Well, you mean but like, you it's, it's not like nicotine. It's not like nicotine, I'm sorry. Nicorette. I Nicorette, thank yeah. you. Because <laughs> nicotine is the nicotine thing you're really is trying to Nicotine is a drug in cigarettes. Yeah. yeah. I meant Nicorette. Yeah. Yeah. Or like methadone to yeah. heroin addicts, right? It's like, yeah. Is that what I need to take? Methadone? Methadone? Yeah. If you're a heroin addict, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you didn't know. That's what they give, Yeah. Wait, what? What? Oh, what? my. No. This is all sudden getting very weird. So what? Yeah. So anyway, drink sparkling water. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. And you don't have the sugar. The sugar is poison. This sparkling water podcast is brought to you. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by LaCroix and Deer Park. Sparkling yeah. water. Right on. Okay. Uh, we're going to look at Unfinished Tales. Cool. Unfinished Tales. Uh, I this don't is like a... reading things that aren't finished. I like... I like things that are finished. Well, I like. Why didn't you let finished. me know before? I'm just saying. I like things that are finished. No, in the things, middle of a podcast me. episode is not the time to be telling. Well, I'm this. saying, how would you feel if I served you an unfinished meal tonight at dinner? Well, the finished part is what I do, right? I'm, I eat it, so I'm the one that finishes no. it. No, I finish it, or else I would have been serving you uncooked food, or. Or are we talking about improperly cooked food? Are we talking about like Finnish, like as in the Finnish language? Because Tolkien was very no, inspired by the Finnish language. Finish. In fact, the, the <laughs> legend of Kalervo. Kalervo. Yeah. Is that where he gets a lot of his weird words from, like mm -hmm. names and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, moving on. All right. So, unfinished tales. Uh, unfinished tales is uh, one of the books that came after the Silmarillion that Christopher Tolkien edited uh, based on all of his, like, just, you know, all of his father's stacks of papers. So these are notes, basically, like scribbles. Yeah, they're like drafts and scribbles, just stuff he didn't, you know, stuff he didn't complete to his liking that didn't really fit with the Silmarillion. Okay. okay? Um, and this was the first book, and then, you know, eventually they put out the whole History of Middle-Earth, which was like 12 volumes right. of the same kind of stuff. But Unfinished Tales is a great one. There's lots of good stuff in here. Um and there's a chapter in here devoted to the Astari and to Tolkien's developed thoughts on where they came from. Um, so we've already mentioned um, Saruman and Gandalf uh -huh. as two of the Astari. Uh -huh. um, but we learned that 
there are a handful of Astari that come to Middle Earth at least, right. and um, uh, and they come in about the year one thousand of the Third Age. And so, just for perspective, right? Uh, the Silmarillion. So the first age ends with uh, the uh, casting of Melkor into your Morgoth into the outer darkness. Okay. Um, and uh, or behind the walls of night or whatever they call it, um, and with the um, destruction of Beleriand, right? And the war, of, the war of wrath, where the Valar, you know, invade and Arondil gets sent into the sky in his in his ship, um, with the Silmaril upon the bow, right? Yes. Um, second age we haven't talked too much about on this podcast yet, but the second age is a period of several thousand years. Okay. And it's the period of Numenor, and then of Sauron, and the last alliance of men and elves. Uh, the first time that Sauron kind of is the main bad guy. Okay. And and then in the Third Age, the Third Age starts with the first de- major defeat of Sauron, and um, and then you know, and then the the ring is the ring is lost, mm-hmm. and then a thousand years into that, they start getting the sense that Sauron is coming back. Right, and so oh, okay. these Astari show up in about the year one thousand of the Third Age, which is okay. which is two thousand years before the time of the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Two thousand okay? years before. Yeah. Okay. So by the time we get to the Hobbit, which is where we first meet Gandalf, right? Like he's been th- around. He's been around in he's, thousands. And he's been around in Middle Earth. For, yeah, two thousand years. Right. In Middle Earth, but he's yeah. existed for thousands of years. Oh yeah, he's existed since the beginning. Since the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it says, uh, yeah, it says the Astari first appeared in Middle Earth about the year 1000 of the Third Age. Um, they appeared like men, uh, and they're, they're kind of clothed like men, uh, but men perceived that they did not die, but remained the same while the fathers and sons of men passed away. Men therefore grew to fear them even when they loved them and they were held to be of the elven race, um, with whom they, indeed, they often consorted. Right. Um, the only one who really knows anything about their origin early on is Círdan. Círdan the shipwright, um, who's one of oh, the elves, yeah. right? That's like one of the last chapters in the Silmarillion, right? Yeah, he's he's in the Silmarillion. He's one yeah. of the characters in the Silmarillion. Yeah. He's, um, oh gosh, oh man, I should have looked this up too. He's not a, I don't think he's a Noldor. I think he's one of the, he's either a Teleri or a Sendar. I think he's a yeah. Sendar. Yeah. Um, of course now I'm thinking maybe a Noldor, but anyway. I was going to say, I thought he was a Noldor, um, but... He he's an elf. Yeah. He's, he's one of the great elf lords, and um, he's always hanging out close to the sea. He loves hanging out yes. close to the sea. Yes. Um, so, Círdan is the one that sees them come over from the west, right? He yes. sees these wizards come over from the west. Yes. And um, and Círdan, of course, is the holder of one of the three rings of the elves. Right. Okay? Yep. Um, as they come... He decides to. He decides that. Uh, actually, let me pause. Um, he sees that coming in shapes weak and humble, they were bidden to advise and persuade man and elves to good, and to seek to unite in love and understanding all those whom Sauron, should he come again, would endeavor to dominate and corrupt. So that the wizards come in order to resist Sauron, but they're not doing it kind of like face to face per se. They're not like walking up to. They're basically coming to build armies right they're, well they're basically coming to not so much to build armies because that's kind of what Saruman ends up doing he, he, he start he builds his own army you know mm. to, to face off against Sauron mm-hmm. really what they're doing is they're trying to muster the free peoples of Middle Earth to resistance to unite them right mm-hmm. um, but they're not allowed to do it in a, in a spirit of domination they have to do it in a way that respects the free will and reason of, and rational, like rational capability of, of the peoples of Middle Earth. That right? lets them make the choice. So they can't walk in and be like, listen up, you losers. Mm-hmm. I'm awesome. You mm-hmm. suck. You better listen to me or I'm going to kill you all. Okay. Right? They can't do that. Right. Right? Right. But um, they are still, I mean, they're basically forming ranks. Like, they've come to... So, yeah, they are forming armies in a way. Like, yeah. you're, you're right about but that. But they have to do it in a way that, like you said, is is respectable yeah right and dignified right and it lets those people have a choice 
Yeah. Like they can't force them to do it. Right. It, yeah. can't, it, it can't make slaves of these people, right? right? It, right. It's, it has to respect the dignity, the inherent dignity of the children mm-hmm. of the Levitar. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, so, um, uh, so, of the number that come over, there's there, the total number that come to Middle-earth of the Astari is unknown, but there's five that come to the north of Middle-earth. Right. Um, the first that comes... Uh, it says was of noble mien and bearing with raven hair and a fair voice and he was clad in white great skill he had in works of hand and he was regarded by well nigh all even by the Eldar as the head of the order that of course is Saruman we let you know we later learned that that's Saruman Mm -hmm. others there were also two clad in sea blue these are the two mysterious blue wizards that we don't know anything about now the thought on them is that they went far into the east they went. They went farther into the east than Saruman and Gandalf, um, and they spent a bunch of time over there. And but no one really knows whatever became yeah, of them. They were never really heard of. Yeah. Again. Right. Um, and then you've got one in earth and brown, and do you know who that is? Radagast. That's Radagast, right? And last came one who seemed the least, less tall than the others, and it looks more aged, gray-haired and gray-clad, and leaning on a staff. Who, of course, is Gandalf. Gandalf, right? Now, let me say real quick. Uh, right here, Radagast shouldn't have been a short little goofy guy, right? No, right. In, yeah, like in the, in movie, the Hobbit you movies, how they cast right? Him, yeah. You know how they how they made him this short yeah. little goofy guy? Yeah. It's like no, like Radagast. He's a Maiar, people. Well, he, not only that, not only that, but it says right here that he's that Gandalf, Gandalf is, is the shortest. Is shorter than him, yeah, right? yeah. You know, so yeah. it's just that bugs me a little bit. Yeah, I can see why they did that. Yeah, that's not. They cool. wanted some like comic relief or something like that. Hard, mm-hmm. hard, you know. It's like, but no, that's not. That's not what it should have been. How he was, yeah. Um. But Círdan, from the first meeting at the Grey Havens, divined in him the greatest spirit and the wisest, meaning Gandalf. He right. divined, divined in Gandalf, and he welcomed him with reverence, and he gave to his keeping the third ring, Narya, Nar- Narya the Red. For, said Círdan, great labors and perils lie before you, and lest your task prove too great and wearisome, take this ring for your aid and comfort. It was entrusted to me only to keep secret, and here upon the west shores it is idle. But I deem that in days ere long to come it should be in nobler hands than mine, that may yield it for the kindling of all hearts to courage. And then you have this little dangling bit, and the gray messenger took the ring and kept it ever secret, yet the white messenger who was skilled to uncover all secrets after a time became aware of the gift and begrudged it. And it was the beginning of the hidden ill will that he bore to the gray, which afterwards became manifest. So Saruman eventually realizes that Círdan had favored Gandalf right. by giving him this red, you know, the, the Narya, the ring, yeah. right? By giving him the, the red ring. Um, and it makes Saruman mad yeah, because Saruman is prideful. Mm-hmm. And he says, I'm the leader of this order. Mm-hmm. I should have gotten the red ring. Yes. I want the ring. Yeah. It's my precious. Yes. Yeah. All right. That was the beginning of the end. Yeah. Um, so, real quick, Kuranir is Saruman's original name, the man of craft, or, um, uh, and that's what the elves call him. Uh, Gandalf, do you know Gandalf's name in the tongue of the elves? Not Alorn, but what's... Oh. Yeah. What is it? It means like Grey Pilgrim or something, right? Yeah. I can't remember the word though. It's uh, Mithrandir. Mithrandir. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, now, as respects, uh, so we already talked about the blue wizards. They don't really mm-hmm. succeed in doing anything that mm-hmm. we know of, and mm-hmm. in terms of resisting Sauron. Now, maybe right. they did some stuff in the east we just don't know about. But that's the whole point: is Tolkien never wrote anything about them. Right. Um, and Radagast, it says, um, became enamored of the many beasts and birds that dwelt in Middle Earth, and forsook elves and men, and spent his days among the wild creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a failure because he fell in love with the animals. Yeah, so I thought that was kind of funny. Well, but it kind of you know it kind of fits because he was apparently, you know, we we learn a little later in this chapter. That oh yeah, he, he was, was chosen by Yavanna. Yavanna, right? Who was yeah. concerned about all the little critters, mm-hmm. right? That was probably her plan all along. It may have been, you know, and so I feel like... Well, she knew that her husband was out, like, she knew those dwarves were going to be an issue, right? So she needed... But it's it's an interesting little lesson because, I mean, in all reckonings, I think Radagast is, um, 
He's not considered a failure in the same way that Saruman is. Oh, absolutely not. But he didn't well, fulfill his mission. Let me, let me finish. Yeah. Right? But you're exa- well, actually, you're exactly right. Right? So Saruman, like, falls. Like, Saruman yeah. is, should have been the leader, probably. Right. Is great and mm-hmm. wise and cunning as he was, right? Mm-hmm. But he totally succumbs to the temptation to use right. power and domination over the free peoples of Middle Earth, right? Right. right. And he decides that he's going to meet Gandalf um, head to toe, right? Yeah. Like there, he's going to go up against him head on, right? Yes. Um, and he grows impatient with waiting, and he lets his pride get the best of him mm-hmm. because he gets mad that Gandalf got the ring and he didn't, right? Right. Yeah. Radagast, on the other hand, is more like the case of failure because he got distracted. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, it's like he got focused. distracted by his studies and by the by the kind of like the things that he loved. And you know, I mean and you know Gandalf like loves all those things as well. Right? Mm-hmm. Like you get this sense that Gandalf is kind of a you know, it's, it's kind of a loves knowledge and loves like just learning about things yeah. as well. Yeah. But the difference between Gandalf and Radagast, it seems, is that Gandalf doesn't let himself get distracted. Yeah, he can put that aside. He can say, okay, it's time to focus on this. Right. And, I, and I think that I, that's something I really have to take to heart because I feel like um, I can easily... Like, I feel like... I mean, you know, sometimes I might get tempted in the way Saruman, Saruman is, but I'm probably more tempted to neglect the things I should be doing in the way that Radagast was, mm-hmm. right? That I'm kind of making the excuse of, well, I'm doing things that are okay, and I'm not doing anything explicitly bad, mm-hmm. you know, but am I really doing the things that I should be? So I don't tend, you know, right. I'm not trying to be super moralizing about this, but um, but it's interesting to think about the difference between not not just Saruman and Gandalf, but Gandalf and Radagast, mm-hmm. right? And, the, and that in mm-hmm. really, in all accounts, Radagast is considered a failure, that he didn't really do much. Yeah. To resist Sauron when, and he probably could have helped a lot, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, I mean, you know, the account is a little bit nice, is a little bit kinder to him, but it's, you know, it still doesn't treat right. him like it treats Gandalf. He still didn't fulfill the purpose with, for which he was sent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm saying. You feel me? Or at least not. You know, maybe he was sent for the purpose that Yvonne sent him. Yeah. Mean, he, he was. Fulfilled the purpose for which Yavanna sent him, but it wasn't the overall mm-hmm. mission. It wasn't the agreed upon mission, right? Right. Yeah. Um. So. Um. Speaking of Yavanna, mm-hmm. so there's another passage in in the chapter about the Astari that um, that talks about where, uh, like, which Valar was responsible for sending which wizard. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so I'm going to read a bit of that. Of major interest, however, is a brief and very hasty sketch of a narrative telling of a council of the Valar, some it seems by Manwe, um, and maybe he called he called upon Eru for counsel, at which it was resolved to send out three emissaries to Middle Earth. So that originally the plan was just to send three. Right. Who would go? For they must be mighty peers of Sauron, but must forego might and clothe themselves in flesh so as to treat on equality and win the trust of elves and men. Now, it's interesting that it says this was Manwe's plan probably after he took counsel from Eru, right? Right. So, right. Manwe is the one that takes, he's like the high priest, right? He's the one that mm-hmm. talks to to God, basically, right, right. right? to Eru, yes. Yes. and understands his, like, mysterious will, right, for how the entirety of history unfolds. Yes. Okay? And so, Manwe has to receive these plans even though he might understand them and and so Manwe pr- provides all these strange requirements right that he can't meet they you know they they must forego might and clothe themselves in flesh so as to treat on equality and win the trust of elves and men but this also imperils them dimming their wisdom and knowledge and confusing them with fears cares and weariness coming from the flesh um two only came forward Kuramo Saruman who was chosen by Aule all right and Alatar, who was sent by Orome. Now, Alatar, where we surmise, is one of the blue wizards. Okay, so right, right, the only right. two that originally initially come forth are Kuramo and Alatar. And then Manwe asks, where is Oloran? Mm-hmm. Oloran, who was clad in gray and having just entered from a journey, had seated himself at the edge of the council, asked what Manwe would have of him. Manwe replied that he wished Oloran to go as the third messenger to Middle-earth. And it is remarked in parentheses that Oloran was a lover of the Eldar that remained, apparently to explain Manwe's choice. 
But Aloran declared that he was too weak for such a task and that he feared Sauron. And this is great. Um, and Manwe says in response to that that that's all the more reason why he should go and that he commanded mm-hmm. Aloran. Um, that Alor- that Aloran should be the third. So o- Gandalf basically says to Manwe when he's told that he want when he tells him he wants him to go. Gandalf says, um, "I'm too weak and mm-hmm. I'm I'm kind of scared, scared of Sauron." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so you see right there that there's a lot of, like Gandalf is wise because he knows his own limits. Yes. Right. Yep. And he's aware yep. of his own fears and he's like, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and and in a way he's like a lot of the great heroes from different story you know other heroes from different stories um he you know the the heroes that we ultimately sympathize with maybe most are those that and we love most are those that realize their own shortcomings right and realize that they're not up to the task and they're kind of underdogs right right makes you want to root for them um and it's almost like you know you almost get the sense that maybe manway maybe eru himself picked out a lauren Mm. right maybe eru himself you know because there's all this stuff in Tolkien, you know, we, we read, one of the first things you read in the opening letter for the Silmarillion is um, is how, and I'm, I, I can't paraphrase it, I, I have to kind of paraphrase what the thought is, but in talking about, you know, the motive that's found in Hobbits of, you know, the little creatures who the great don't account of being of much consequence at all, or the ones that overcome, you know, that yeah. overcome the great powers, Yeah. just like Luthien is really the hero of the story of Baron and Luthien, and mm-hmm. she's the one that you know enables Baron to fulfill his heroic duty. Um, so uh, we see that same thing with Aloran. We see that same idea and theme with Aloran. Yeah. Um, and Varda, Manwe's spouse, looks uh, looks at Aloran and says, "But he's not going as the third, right?" You know, she's trying to put across this thing that, you know, I don't, we don't really know exactly what she meant by that, but basically she's saying that he's not like third in the order of priority, right? And it says that Kurumo remembered that. So Saruman sees these little indications that Gandalf is supposed to be playing some, even though he knows he's greater than Gandalf, or he thinks he's greater than oh. Gandalf. Oh. So she's has, saying that she was hinting at the fact that he's actually greater than third. Or at least equal. Right, equal. E- equal to Saruman. But he's not lesser. I right. thought, because when I first read that, I thought that maybe she was saying that he would be lesser than third. No, she says not as the third. I know, not as the third, right? But you can either interpret that as that means he's greater than the third or he's less than, right? Like maybe he should be going as the fifth. Yeah, that doesn't seem, well, that doesn't seem to be like something Varda would say. It doesn't you know what I'm saying? either to me, but I was like, but then you know we read before that he was Gandalf was the last one that was mentioned as coming so that's mm-hmm. why I thought maybe what she was saying was that he was going to come fifth right to throw them all off the scent oh well that's I guess that's possible but I don't know it's you know Koromo I think reads it the way we read it you know the way I was reading it which yeah. is that he's my know, competition yeah yeah um and then it says that Koromo um took Iwendil which is Radagast because Yavanna begged him, and that Alatar took Palando as a friend. So Alatar and Palando are the three, are the two blue wizards. The names of the two blue wizards in right. in Valinor. Um, so um, yeah, so we've got Aloran corresponds to Manwe and Varda. So Gandalf corresponds uh-huh. to Manwe and Varda. Uh-huh. Koromo corresponds to Ale, um, Saruman. Uh-huh. Radagast corresponds to Yavanna and. Alatar to Orome and Palando also to Orome. Uh, so, because what you said, what, what what was determined was that they were only going to send three. Right. Right. So those other two kind of tagged along as like friends. They weren't actually chosen. Do you know what I'm saying? Why did they end up taking five? As it, opposed to he doesn't three? get real specific on. Okay. Um, but do you think they were actually chosen by the Valar? Those other two. Um. I know it says that Yavanna begged. They're at least permitted. People to. Yeah, I mean. Or begged that. Yavanna, or Radagast, obviously, yeah, is by yeah. Yavanna. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's interesting that Gandalf doesn't get to bring in a, a pal. Yeah. You know, like, he has Saruman, a big one. Saruman brings Radagast as kind of yeah. his little pal, his little buddy. And, um, uh, you know, the blue, the, the first blue wizard gets to bring another blue wizard with him, but. Right. 
No, no, no little buddy for Gandalf. No little buddy for Gandalf because he's tough. I guess so. He doesn't need any help. I don't need you. I don't need your. I don't need your charity. That's right. I can survive on my own. All right. Um. Uh, let's see. One other, two other things in this bit. Um, so a little bit later, the next page in Unfinished Tales. Um, it says clearly that the Astari were all Maiar. That is, persons of the angelic mm -hmm. order, though not necessarily of the same rank. So just right. to reiterate, all the Astari are Maiar. Mm -hmm. They're lesser than the Valar. Um, they're spirits, but capable of self-incarnation and could take humane, especially elvish forms. Yeah. Um, Saruman is said to be the chief of the Astari. That is, higher in Valinorian stature than the others. Um... It, interestingly, it says Gandalf was evidently the next in order. Radagast is presented as a person of much less power and wisdom. Okay. Of the other two, nothing is said in published works save the reference to the five wizards and the altercation between Gandalf and Saruman. Okay. Um, and and they were supposed to act. Um, let's see. It may be seen that they were free each to do what they could do in their mission, that they were not commanded or supposed to act together in a small central body of power and wisdom and that each had different powers and inclinations and were chosen by the Valar with this in mind. Um, anyway, uh, last thing I want to read is this little poem about him. So, I'm going to read this poem. Okay. All right. Is this a poem that Tolkien wrote? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 16 lines of alliterative verse. What does that mean, alliterative verse? Well, um like the consonant sound, right? So the consonant sounds repeat. So listen to it. You'll see. Oh, right. oh, 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 got it. Wilt thou learn the lore that was long secret of the five that came from a far country? One only returned, others never again. Until under men's dominion, Middle Earth shall seek until Dagor Dagorath and the doom cometh. How hast thou heard it, the hidden counsel of the lords of the West and the land of Amman? The long roads are lost that led thither. And to mortal men, Manwe speaks not. From the west that was, a wind bore it to the sleeper's ear, in the silences under night's shadow. When news is brought from lands forgotten and lost ages, over seas of years, to the searching thought. Not all are forgotten by the elder king. Sauron he saw as a slow menace. So you hear that, like how the uh -huh. different consonant sounds would repeat? Yes. Yeah. Pretty nifty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and last little bit, we go back to letters. Okay. Okay. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the sacrifice that Gandalf makes. Okay. This is a spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We already did a the spoiler alert. The real one. Alert. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Gandalf obviously, you know, dies. He, he, he falls. At the bridge. At the bridge of Casa Doom against when he's fighting the Balrog. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. And in letter um, two or one fifty six, which is written to um, Father Robert Murray, who was a Jesuit priest who was a correspondent, you know, corresponded with Tolkien. Um, Tolkien has some things to say about Gandalf's sacrifice. All right. Um, why they should take such a form is bound up with the mythology of the angelic powers of the world of this fable. At this point in the fabulous history, the purpose was precisely to limit and hinder their exhibition of power on the physical plane, and so that they should do what they were primarily sent for, train, advise, instruct, arouse the hearts and minds of those threatened by Sauron to a resistance with their own strengths, and not just to do the job for them. They thus appeared as old sage figures. But in this mythology, all the angelic powers concerned with this world were capable of many degrees of error and failing between the, between the absolute satanic rebellion and evil of Morgoth and his satellite Sauron and the faience, uh, the, fa the faintance of some of the other higher powers or gods. The wizards were not exempt, indeed, being incarnate were more likely to stray or err. Gandalf alone fully passes the tests on a moral plane anyway. He does make mistakes of judgment. For in his condition, it was for him a sacrifice to perish on the bridge in defense of his companions, less perhaps than for a mortal man or, or hobbit, less perhaps than for a mortal man or hobbit, since he had a far greater inner power than they. 
but also more since it was a humbling and abnegation of himself in conformity to the rules. For all he could know at that moment, he was the only person who could direct the resistance to Sauron successfully, and all his mission was vain. He was handing over to the authority that ordained the rules uh, and giving up personal hope of success. Um, so it's interesting that Tolkien talks about, you know, do you, so do you get the sacrifice that, that Tolkien is making, is kind of elaborating on there with Gandalf? I think so. Okay. You want to try, do you want to try to put it in your own words or do you want to? Well, the way I personally understood it was just that, um, while, you know, by, by Gandalf giving his life at the bridge, that that's, you can't really say it's the same kind of sacrifice that a mortal being would make, mm -hmm. right? Because they're dead, and then they're, like, dead, dead. Mm -hmm. Like, dead. Um, but it was still a sacrifice for Gandalf in the sense that he was giving up his chance to really be successful at his mission. Okay. Or to... I mean, not... I mean, there's still... You know, he can still participate, I think, in some way, but he's give. It's a sacrifice. It's more of like a pride thing, right? right. It's like, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to fulfill my duty here. Yeah, and and in addition, there's an additional element to it, right? Because Gandalf has the option to basically slough off his incarnate body. I thought and he said he didn't. Well, I think in this, I think, I think the point, part of the point that Tolkien's making, in addition to what you said, is that, and I, maybe I'm wrong, uh, this is what I took away from it, right, in addition to what you said, mm -hmm. that Gandalf could show himself, right, like could have shown himself on the bridge of khazad and had more power, right, okay. you know, to resist the Balrog, right, Okay. but he obeyed the rule, like the rule that was put upon him was that he couldn't, right, mm -hmm. he was not allowed to do that in resisting Sauron. Okay. Doesn't he get really big, though? Like, doesn't he... I, I don't I think not... he uses some special... I think he... I'm not saying that he cheats, but I feel like... And maybe this was a, another thing that's not consistent between the movie and the book, but I feel like he did kind of channel some extra He does. Power. I mean, he definitely uses... Um, he definitely uses some power that he normally doesn't use. But you were saying that he he could have like basically shown himself yeah. as the Meyer that well, he is. The body, right, the the incarnate wearing that body subjects him. It, it we we read in the other in the in the, mm -hmm. the Astari chapter that um to human that taking on that form weakens problems, the Astari, yeah. right? Right. That it's um it's a burden for them mm -hmm. in a way, right? Um it makes them less wise. Um, it makes them tired. Tired, yeah. and, you know. It makes them subject to all of the, all of the things that we're subject to as human beings with bodies. Right. 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 Um, so you're saying that in that battle against the Balrog, he could have sloughed that off. In, in theory, right? In theory. That, that he could have, you know, if 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 there's any if there's any point at which he has a mandate, you know, that he could come back and say, well, I really had no other choice. Yeah. You know, there you go. Yeah. But. He ref he doesn't because he doesn't want to break the rule, right? That this is this was a very important rule apparently that was placed upon him that you cannot do this, and he didn't know he was going to be mm. ra you know raised. He didn't he didn't know that he was going to come back. That's what you're so that's what I take to mean by he's giving up all personal hope of success, right? He's basically laying this down at the feet of Eru and saying, "I guess my job is I guess my work is done, mm -hmm. and I guess I failed," mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. In my own part of it. So, you know, he's basically having to say, I'm, you know, thy will, you know, thy will be done. Kinda, right. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't know what lies, what lies beyond for him. Okay. Right. Um, so it was a choice between following the rules and failing, right? Or breaking the rules and succeeding. In and theory. He chose the yeah. First. Yeah. But, but again, you know, it's like that, it's like the ring, right? Frodo is constantly tempted to put the ring on in order to accomplish his mission, mm, right? Mm -hmm. And and he you know he he's tempted by this thought that you know this thing I could maybe I could even walk in to Mordor with the ring on, mm -hmm. 
and no one would even notice me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but he chooses not to because he's been told he's he can't, right? right? He, yeah. He's told there's a greater danger that if he does, there will be a problem. Right, right. Um, he's kind of going rogue if he does, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and to elaborate on that, um, it says a little later in the same letter, but by that he would at the end have meant more than at the beginning. He was sent by a mere prudent plan of the angelic valor or governors. But authority had taken up this plan and enlarged it at the moment of its failure. He says, Naked I was sent back for a brief time until my task is done. Sent back by whom and whence? Not by the gods, the Valar, whose business is only with this embodied world in its time. For he passed out of thought and time. Naked is, alas, unclear. It was, it was meant just literally unclothed like a child, not discarnate, and so ready to receive the white robes of the highest. Galadriel's power is not divine. And his healing in Lorien is meant to be no more than physical healing and refreshment. Um, Gandalf may be enhanced in power, but if still embodied, he must still suffer care and anxiety in the needs of the flesh. Um, so when he comes back, it seems like what's changed. So Ga- so so Tolkien it seems like he's saying that it's not like Gandalf just becomes this omnipotent being when he comes back, right? He does mm-hmm. he doesn't gain all of this power but he's no longer just on the mission of the valar okay. when he comes back right because his mission the valar mission for him ended when he perished at the bridge okay. of casadam okay. but he's brought back by a greater power and we don't we don't know many specifics on that but basically it almost sounds like his death causes him to be drawn up to another to the under the authority of Eru directly almost mm. right Hmm. Um, that there's a greater, there's a greater power at work now through Gandalf. That, at least that's the way I read it. Yeah, I agree. That's the way I read it. It's almost like he's glorified in some way. Right? Yeah. Like he's, he's, um, you know, been refined and he's made his sacrifice, right? And he's been rewarded in a way for that. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not that. Um, it's not that he can't be hurt anymore, you know. It's not like he's impervious, right? Um, invulnerable. He's just he's greater than he was before, and he's got a greater, maybe even a, a even greater purpose than he had before. Right. So anyway, right. Um. So yeah, I just thought that was kind of cool. That is very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything I didn't cover about old Gandalf that you wished I had? He did a pretty good darn. Pretty darn I mean, good job. There's lots more that could be said about Gandalf, but I, I wanted to cover a lot of the just kind of his history and background. History background yeah. and kind of the more deeper philosophical mm-hmm. stuff about mm-hmm. Gandalf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's good. If you get letters if you get the letters of Tolkien, there's all kinds of stuff on Gandalf in there that I didn't you know, I didn't cover. I'll just, you know the to, to to look at his listing here and yeah, I mean there's like a numerous, numerous, numerous pages that speak of Gandalf and the letters. So if you want to know more about Gandalf, I highly recommend picking up the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien edited by Humphrey Carpenter. And um, I highly recommend picking it up even if you just want to know more about Tolkien. So. All right. All right. That's good. Good stuff. All righty. Well, I guess then uh, that's a wrap on another episode. Amazing. Episode 70. That's so cool. Yeah. 70. Yeah. Awesome. Before you know it, we'll be to 72. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we will. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, John. I learned a, I learned a lot. Good. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Yes, and, thank um, you. And don't forget to send in those haiku for the next two chapters of Lord of the Rings by August 3rd. And we will talk at you next time. Yeah, we shall. Peace out. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll be continuing our discussion of Lord of the Rings with Book 2, Chapter 8, Farewell to Lorien. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.